this area, because it was renowned as being um, a poor area, a deprived area, um, it has always been um, somewhere cheap that new migrants can come to and maybe just about afford to live in a room or somewhere. Um, and, um, and so it's had a very long tradition of different communities, different migrants coming from different parts of the world. The other reason it's had a very long tradition of this is, in fact, if we were to go all the way over there, we would be right on the docks and effectively lots and lots of people that were travelling by sea and goods and everything were coming through the docks of East London. Uh, so the water is just, you know, it's a stone's throw almost away. So again, it's another reason um, that people were attracted to this area or ended up staying in this area and never leaving. Someone in the family, probably more, more likely the men in the family, could go and get a job at the docks. There's a chance of a casual labour, employment, etc. To break it down roughly, you've got the, I believe, the Huguenots uh, who came from France, so in the 15th century. The Huguenots moved here en masse because they were being persecuted in France because of their religious beliefs. And then you've got Chinese community and also sailors and seafarers from, particularly from around the Bengal area of India. So the East India Company was set up by Britain mostly to raid what became the colonies. They call it trade, but really it was raiding. The East India Company was, was huge and basically they were importing or bringing spices, presumably jewels, tea, yeah. everything. Absolutely. And then uh, one of the other communities that came here in large numbers would have been the Jewish community. Meanwhile, while all these people were coming here, you know, they were all setting up things and making things, making small businesses. So bit by bit, Different communities came in, different communities moved out. As they became more prosperous, the whole area has a history of docks, seafaring, trade. So this became basically a haven for people that had those skills and um, used them to great effect. This bookshop here, uh, uh, and press really, called the Freedom Press, was, a, was established in the um, 1880s, so a really long time ago, and was one of the first political anarchist uh, presses in, in the country. And there's been a bookshop here since, I think, the 1960s. And it's really been a, a politically acti active publishing house and place for pamphleteers throughout that period. And also, there's, it's been a target for a huge amount of fascists, confrontation here, famously in the early 90s when they tried to burn it down. And then of course you've got these murals going on with the um, shutters, which I think is very interesting. And also the red um, from, uh, well, at least a few of the murals, I mean, it kind of matches the uh, frame around the windows and the colour of that as well. And we've even also got the, the little alleyway that we came through, um, which was kind of a bit cramped it's certainly a feature of um, old East London. You can see that here, the street signage also gives an indicator as to what kind of trade and businesses were run in the area. So we've got Fashion Street, which effectively is the first turning of Brick Lane itself. The name kind of points to the tradition of the rag trade, as it was called, clothing, tailoring. Well, that was established, I think, mostly by the Jewish community, maybe from the 80, late 1800s, but certainly after the Second World War, for sure. Businesses were largely taken over by the Bangladeshi community as it took uh, prominence in the area. Fashion Street in Bengali. Mm -hmm. Fashion Street. It's the curves, isn't it, and the materials that makes that contrast between old London and new London. Again, if you look at the street lamp, Victorian London, gas lamp kind of look. Mm -hmm. But those flats at the back are distinctly modern. The little signs which are sort of uh, all about, but kind of give little, little signifiers for how someone thinks we should be looking at these places.
but the church at the end is Christ Church Spitalfields, and it was designed by someone called Hawksmoor for postmodern architects. It's like really, really important, and the reason they think it's really, really important, these postmodern architects, um, is because it mixes styles together. So it's not just classical. You might look at it and think this looks like just a classical church, but the pillars and the um, language of the pillars, which might come from Rome or might come from um, Renaissance Italy or even from um, Egypt, some of the designs have all been muddled together. And that's one of the reasons that the postmodernists in the 19... 19- 80s really, really liked it. And there are a number of his churches, all Hawksmoor's <coughs> churches, all in the East End of London. Um, and that's uh, another day out. This is one example of some of the cool cultural underground street uh, kind of side of, of Brick Lane, in as much as you've got that in Brixton and Hackney, and again, all of these. Um, impoverished areas was how you describe them um, and so Brick Lane was renowned for the shop it's also renowned for the Big Chill Bar which is over there um, and a, a club called um, 93 Feet East um, and the Vibe Bar and um, various kind of underground venues um, and one of the music scenes that sort of slightly came out of this area was the Asian underground movement. Um, some of the key artists started off in this area um, and grew up here. Harun and Farooq Shamsher, who later became known as just Joy. Um, they were making basically drum and bass, techno, trip hop, um, and, and putting in kind of South Asian samples, you know, there'd be flutes, Bansuri flutes or sitars or, you know, uh, kind of slightly Lata Mangeshka type vocals or doublas, dolls. Um, but it was cool underground music and everybody who was like non-Asian could dance to this as well. To uh, the history of the Jewish community being here, um, you've got Bagel Bakery 1 and Bagel Bakery 2, there's two of them. People travel for miles to come to these two bagel bakeries. Even they're usually open late at night. I guess they uh, have always been quite cheap to to eat. Um, great late night snack at four in the morning. Sometimes when I finish DJing at Rich Mix, I pop over here before going home to just get a little something. It's something I've always done. Yeah. Um, I never realised that this. In the 1930s, there was a fascist group based here, uh, run by Oswald uh, Mosley. Um, and consequently, there was a battle off Cable Street, which is depicted in a mural, uh, which was basically to try and boot, uh, uh, boot out um, Mosley's uh, fascists. Um, and then with regard to the Bangladeshi community here, um, I, I mean, people had a horrendous time, you know, of having dog poop put through their letterboxes um, or um, having um, their places set on fire, um, as well as actual physical attacks. And one of the parks that's not far from where we're going is actually called, it's been renamed uh, Altab Ali Park. Uh, Altab Ali was a, a 25-year-old young man, Bangladeshi man, who was working here in one of the textile um, kind of, you know, shops. And he was uh, uh, set upon by a gang and murdered um, in uh, the park that has now been named after him. And so really after the murder of Al Bali in 1978, um, that's when the community here started fighting back big time and they gradually tried to kick the racists out. Where I grew up, I was actually born in Forest Gate, but we lived um, in the Ilford area. There was one time as well I was uh, going to meet a friend, um, my best friend at school, we were going to go and watch a film um, at the cinema in South Woodford and I took the bus from Ilford all the way to Woodford and 
when I came out of the underpass, um, so I was about about this big at the time, and. Um, and as I walked around the corner, there was a whole gang of skinheads that were coming around the corner towards me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, you know. As it turned out, they decided not to kill me. But what they did do, as they literally walked right through me, one little girl, they, they just kind of went, Zikai, Zikai, Zikai. I mean, just like such a Nazi, fascist, racist thing to do. Um, I mean, in, 19, in the 1970s, you know, we weren't that much further away from the Second World War, which had only finished in 1945. So, um, and all the stories of the Holocaust and what they did to, you know, Jewish people, disabled people, gay people, etc., black people, you know, just, yeah, just, you know, it was a bad time. Anyway, my uh, dad used to teach in Balance Road, is it over there somewhere? Um, um, and I was taken to his school whenever I had flu or tonsillitis or whatever, which is quite a lot. <laughs> um, and so I used to sit in my dad's um, metalwork class or woodwork class. Um, and could see a lot of the, the changes that were going on in this area as more and more of the Bangladeshi community came to live here. Um, and mum, as I say, taught in uh, Blue Gate Fields Infant School over on that side towards Shadwell. Um, and she, I messaged my mum this morning, who's 86 years old, um, and she said that around 1970 they had maybe one or two Bangladeshi children at Blue Gate Field Infant School. And then in 1973, by 1973, um, about 70% of the school was Bangladeshi, um, which posed some, you know, big challenges for the teachers there because they were now dealing with a school community, um, many of whom didn't speak any English at all, some that who were illiterate. Um, there was only one English as a second language support teacher. Um, so there were, it, it was a lot of big changes culturally and socially and so on. Um, and you know, a school is meant for learning, but when you're dealing with very basic things like uh, can the child actually um, communicate at all and understand any of the lessons that you're trying to give, um, or are they living in you know some shoddy you know, 20 people to a one-bedroom flat, um, have they had any breakfast that morning because there may not have been any money for them to be fed? Um, those were quite basic sort of things that, um, that the, the relatively new community was dealing with and the people that were trying to teach or work with them were also dealing with in this area. I think it's quite interesting to see uh, the difference in in, in the way we express ourselves as individuals, and it's not just because of um, the the people that we are and the families that we that we've been in, but it, like our culture and environment also um, matters a lot and affects how we express ourselves and we um, and how we talk. And so, and I think it's really interesting because I think like uh, I think like Ritu said something about how. Uh, the migrants, they didn't even know the language, uh, they didn't even know English, but they, they still managed to come here and find work uh, where they didn't need to use speech to connect them to these other people. All they needed to use were their hands, you know, it was all manual labor. And I found that very interesting because um, if you think about it, we put so much emphasis on, on, on the language, on being able to say these words to one another. but what defines us is is in the way we express ourselves and i think um our gestures and our emotions are so different from one another and i can see that just in this group and how diverse we are and how each of us has a way of uh talking and speaking and communicating and so like for my for for my work i kind of want to focus on like the power of communication but communication not through words communication through um you know uh expression through gestures through um uh, ideas in brooklyn uh what inspired me was uh a street art 
uh, that like co uh, that one work covers one another and uh, also um, the also like the layers on the walls how like they sometimes scratched uh, they are painted or we can see the um, like uh, what was left like from posters tags and um, what and what was also like important for me is like overlaying uh, over like overlaying of history and like the waves like of immigration if we can say so so how like it is all um how it is all mixed and how we can feel actually the history by walking through uh by walking on the streets and walking like through this and how we can actually see uh, and how we can look uh, on and how like on the streets we can find the presence of the uh, of the time and the details of the time from for example like Jewish wave of immigration from uh, the, uh, from the wave of immigration in uh, in the uh, 1950s and it was and what it was like really inspiring for me and um, what I also found interested uh, what I also found interesting is that um, the names were also like inscribed in uh, Bengali um, as well as in English.